Welcome to another episode of the SNC podcast. I am your host, Falashare Anoji. Before I get on with this episode, I want to take a moment to speak about the global health pandemic. The negative impact from the coronavirus disease is crushing and heartbreaking. My thoughts and prayers are also with the hundreds of thousands of people who are sick and have lost loved ones to COVID-19. Hopefully, a cure is found soon. I'm also thankful for all the health officials here in Nigeria and around the world who are doing their absolute best despite the circumstances. Please continue to stay safe. On this episode, I spoke with Oliver Nwomu, a respected visual artist, brand strategist, art administrator, and curator based in Lagos, Nigeria. We spoke about the state of visual arts in Nigeria, the process behind art valuation, art forgery, and more. Oliver Emo, welcome to the SNC podcast. Thank you, Shadi. Thank you so much for being here. Happy and to be. I am excited about the conversation that we're going to be having today. Yeah. But before we get knee deep into the conversation, let me introduce you. Sure. Good. So you are an artist, curator, art administrator, author, writer, publisher, and brand strategist. You're also the founder, executive director, and trustee of the Ben M. Momo Foundation. In addition, you are the president of the Society of Nigerian Artists, director of Omenka Gallery, and CEO of Revelo. Did I get that right? Revelo. Revelo. Revelo Company Limited. You sit on the boards of various organizations, including the Reproduction Rights Society of Nigeria and the Lagos Bien... Is that... How do you pronounce that? Bien... Biennial? Correct. Okay. And I would be remiss if I didn't add that your father was the late celebrated Nigerian creative artist, Professor Benedict Chukukadibia. Good try. (laughs) (laughs) What what was was up about that? Okay. Chukukadibia. Okay. So what was it like growing up with a father like yours? And how did that, if it did, affect how you perceive and appreciate the arts? Well, it was very interesting, uh, now that I think about it in retrospect, because um, it's, um, it's very easy for an artist's son to imbibe some of his father's uh, uh, leanings. I mean, I grew up smelling paint around the house. I saw him sculpt, you know, so this made a very strong impression on me as a child. And uh, while growing up, uh, he was very happy to notice, observe rather, that uh, I had a uh, talent and it was very encouraging. You know, while I was at King's College, I knew that he helped me cheat on a couple of assignments, <laughs> art assignments, and he was very proud that uh, I won prizes while at St. was even at primary school. Uh-huh. So he was a very encouraging father, very supportive, and he always wanted, you know, his, um, his children to always be busy. He couldn't uh-huh. stand... Uh, anyone who wasn't doing anything at a particular time. He always wanted you to be busy and he always believed in excellence. So he believed in whatever you do, you make sure that you do it to the best of your ability. Mm. So that was very important. And these were lessons that we grew up learning. Great. And was he the kind of father that said, okay, it's great that you have this artistic or creative background, but I still want you to go to school and become a doctor. Or he was supportive of the fact that if you want to pursue this professionally, go ahead and do that. Well, he always wanted his kids to um, pursue the academics, very important. Uh, But uh, I was his youngest son, Mm. or I am his youngest son, and he wanted uh, his youngest son to be a priest. Wow. So I turned out wrong. (laughs) 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 So I was supposed to be the one dedicated. Yeah. Wow. So you were like, so were you like, (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry. What a priest I would have turned out. I know, (laughs) right? When I was young, I wanted to become a nun because of Sound of Music. I know. And then I realized that the life that I live, I would be kicked out of the convent. (laughs) (laughs) Same here. So we share a lot in common. Yeah, right. Very refreshing. I know. So what about your mom? Well, was she was she also supportive of you? My mother was supportive, but uh, as uh, far as I can remember, 
she always wanted me to be a doctor. Mm. Yeah, so I was supposed to be a neurosurgeon. Wow. But that turned out wrong as well. Yeah. <laughs> Why did she want to become a neurosurgeon? Well, uh, because in her own time, she wanted to be a doctor herself. Oh, I yes. see. So she was kind of living her dreams through mm, me. Through you. Yes. Okay. But, and before I move on, I should note that you graduated from the University of Lagos, Nigeria, yes. where you earned a degree in biochemistry yes. and advanced diploma in exploration geophysics yes. with the distinction yes. and a postgraduate diploma in in applied geophysics and visual arts, yes. also with the distinction. Yes. And you also hold the distinction as the best graduating master's in art history student from Unilag. Yes. Uh, now, I'm going to start off asking, yes. why do you think that a lot of Nigerians are afraid to talk about death? Well, that's a very complex question. Okay. But I think that um, a lot of people, especially in Nigerians, we grew up with family. You know, family around us, we have lots of shared relationships, a lot of, sh of, um, of um, shared ambitions. So no one ever really feels he's had enough time to achieve or accomplish this, uh, these things that he set out for himself or herself. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people still feel very attached to their loved ones. I think Nigerians... Uh, by virtue of who they are, they're very full of life. I mean, think about Lagos with all this chaos and the hustle and bustle of Lagos. You know, people enjoy that. So no one wants to just leave that behind, you know, just like that. So in as much as we're a very religious country and on every street you see a church or two, but I think Nigerians still are very full of zest and life. Yeah, but do you think that in addition to being full of life and zest and all these things that we want to accomplish, yeah. it is still important that we have conversations regarding the fact that tomorrow anybody can die and Absolutely. we need to have proper plans in place on what, could, on what will happen when that person passes on. Oh, I agree with you. Um, it's very important to have plans in place. I think that uh, our corporate sector, they scream about this almost every day with pensions. They scream about it with what happens to the afterlife. And even artists, we artists are beginning to think because a number of us, you know, have passed away without leaving proper uh, plans in place for successive generations. So I think it's very important planning your estate, you know, when you pass away. It's very important. Yeah. Um, an artist knowing that uh, your works become ambassadors even after you've passed on. So what happens to these works? How are they cared for? How are they kept for the next generation? What happens to your history or your contributions to art You know, in your local country and even internationally? These are conversations that artists are beginning to have and collectors are beginning to have. Mm. What happens to their collections after? Yeah, because I, I asked that question because it goes to part of the conversation we're going to be having today, which is... Super. You're the heir of a famous creative, yes. and you lost your father in 1994, right? Yes. Did your father have conversations regarding having an estate plan? Yes. And did he also talk about what he wanted yes. to happen while he was still alive and yes. after he died? Absolutely. He always uh, spoke of giving five of his works to the federal government of Nigeria, oh, wow. uh, while the rest, you know, were for our education, you know, to make sure that uh, each child is uh, educated to the best of their ability. So that was very important for him. So he five to the federal government, the rest were to be given to my mother, oh. you know, and to make sure that she, she trades exhibits, you know, and um, gains her sustenance from that for herself mm -hmm. and for her children. Okay, yes. so before he died, he had taken some legal and business steps on in putting putting oh, down. Yes. He right? had a will. Oh, he had a will. Yes. Okay, great. Will. Okay, so I mean, your father is not here, so I need to ask him all these questions. Yes. I was just thinking about how, you know, how he went about choosing an executor. Yes. Just when we think about putting together an estate plan, there yes. there are certain steps people have to take yes. in order for the um, estate plan to actually function properly. And I just wanted to talk about that. Yes. After your father died. You and your siblings, how, what was going through your mind in terms of keeping your father's legacy at the forefront of Nigerian culture, Nigerian art culture? Because it's one thing for your father to say he wants to have five pieces of art go to the government and Absolutely. the rest to your mother. But you as children, what was going through your minds in order to secure his legacy? Well, it was very important for us because uh, when he passed away, even in his lifetime, we had people coming over to do their research on him. We know a lot of artists 
on uh, those in the academia today who have gained their PhDs, just some research work on him. So it's very important for us to put all of this together. Uh, my mom busied herself with uh, making sure that his written manuscripts were properly typed. She spent a lot of wow. hours, you know, making sure that was put together. So my siblings and I sat down and we thought about the best way to preserve his legacy in a structured format. And then we thought about the foundation. And because I'm an, I'm an artist and I was the one in the art, they all decided to support me mm -hmm. in making sure that um, you know we have this foundation that is established to preserve his legacy. And the foundation was established in 2003, mm -hmm. you know, and um, through exhibitions, debates, you know, residencies, you know, we try as much as possible, you know, to preserve his legacy. Um, now we're working on the catalog resume, which uh, is a compendium of all these known pieces because we're trying to stem the spate of forgeries that are. Um, you know, of course, when an artist begins to appreciate and value, you have unscrupulous people who want to make quick money from mm. it. So that has been, you know, one of the um, um, uh, one of our approaches to ensure that we we'll preserve his legacy. And preserving his legacy also means even merchandise, anything within his image. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, we even have uh, the international community of academics, you know, who write every now and then. Those who are doing books who want images of his work. So we're busy with that. And we're also planning more exhibitions both uh, on the local and international scene. Okay. You know, just um, a couple of years ago, the Tate in the UK had an exhibition, you know, um, with uh, him, you know, at the forefront, you know, talking about Nigerian modernism mm. in art. So, of course, we're very happy to also work with these institutions in preserving and promoting his legacy. And you touched on something about yeah. forgeries. Yeah. How does... So, backtrack, a catalogue, raisonné, is that how you yes. pronounce it? What, what is that exactly? It's a compendium of all his known works. Got it. You know, verified and authenticated. Okay. I think it's just important that we always break these terms down. Not everybody know go to school. <laughs> no, you did. You did. <laughs> <laughs> now, we talked about forgeries, right? Yes. How does that affect the, I guess, the standing of an artist's work? Because yes. people may just say, well, it's a forgery. Anybody would know what an original Ben and one work is. Yes. But... Obviously, I, think, I feel like you have a different perspective on how forgeries affects your father's work, right? Yes. Okay, let's talk about that. Well, forgeries affect my father's work and every other artist. artist. In the sense that uh, it causes a depreciation of his works. You know, you have works that are done by um, artists that are not as strong, so it weakens, you know. I mean, with the general perspective, when people see a forgery that is extremely poor, you know, then you judge the artist based on that, mm. you know, and then collectors, I mean, the, the whole beauty about art is the exclusiveness of the art of a piece. You know, when an artist's piece is created in multiples, then each multiple becomes uh, smaller in value. Mm. So you can imagine a collector having uh, a piece where there are five of those, you know, then it's not as valuable as the proper piece. Got it. So in many ways, it affects uh, the value of an artist's work and is over. What, what is that, Uber? It's uh, um, his body of work. Got it, over. okay, yes. great. Now I want to move on to the work that you do. Yes. Like I mentioned in the beginning of our conversation, you yes. are a well-rounded creative and a businessman. Thank you. For example, you have exhibited your works across several countries, including Nigeria, yes. the United Kingdom, yes. United States, Ireland, and South Africa at the Joburg Art Fair. Art Fair. You also, your works also form part of many significant private and public government collections, including yes. the Bank of Industry, yes. the Delta State Government, and so many others. Yes. Now, for someone who wants to become an artist or is an artist and wants his or her work to become part of these types of collections. Can you talk about the process of how that happens? Let's start off first with how you go about having an exhibition. What does that even mean to have an exhibition as an artist? Well, uh, for me, an exhibition is about um, displaying your works, introducing okay. your work, you know, to the public space, you know, to collectors, to critics, you know, so that, uh, so usually you have something to say. An exhibition also serves uh, purposes of sales so you can make money from it for your sustenance and to continue on pursuing your career. So for me, that's the two-pronged approach to uh, having an exhibition. Now, how do you go about having an exhibition? Before you go, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, that's, okay. yeah, uh -huh. All right. Um, I think that um, you start by creating your own philosophy 
because uh, not many spaces would want to show your work if you're not, you know, if you haven't reached a point where you have defined your philosophy. Mm. So, you, know, you need to get to a point where, you know, you are viewed upon as a serious artist because, you know, most of the spaces are galleries and these galleries already have already been in business for a while. So they want an artist who has a defined philosophy. You know, so he knows what he's doing, he's aware of his techniques, he's not just experimenting, you know. But the easiest way to start is probably through group exhibitions where you and maybe other artists of your ilk, you know, show together. Mm -hmm. So you can enter into group shows, you can have joint shows. And then for me, the peak of having an exhibition is when you have a solo show, which means that you are now ready. You're no mm. longer experimenting, but you have something to say, you know, about your work. Of course, it is true that artists will go on trying to strive to achieve perfection all through their careers, but you must get to some appreciable points, you know, where you can have shows. So they shouldn't be so regular, but uh, for me, these are the processes. Now, these days, the alternative spaces where you can have, you know, mm -hmm. exhibitions, but uh, the purists still believe that it should be a proper gallery space or you can have a museum show, you know. So I think, uh, um, essentially, these are the ways, but you must get into the public space. You know, for me, that's, um, you, you must gain some sort of public acceptance, you know, and that for me shows, you know, uh, how relevant your work will be. Would you consider yourself a purist? Um, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. But that for me is the beauty of art, mm -hmm. because uh, I think it's the only profession where, you know, it's actually living mm. in the sense that there's an art to speaking, there's an art to wearing clothes, an art to working, well, and walking as well. But um, let's go back to art, you know, and um, art can be viewed as a functional piece where you can even sit on it, mm. or even as cooking utensils, and then you can actually have fine art, which, you know, are for appreciation purposes, aesthetic value. Then you can also have art for religious purposes. You know, there's so many varying functions of art that, you know, and people have even been known to have investment-worthy art. Mm. So it's even a store of value as well. So for me, it's so broad-based that it's difficult to box art into, um, you know, a framework, for instance. You know, and I think that um, uh, having said that, um, you have art that uh, exists in galleries. Well, you have art that is in public space, for instance, Statues of Mandela, for instance, a public space, and mm -hmm. remind people of how great this man has been mm -hmm. in his lifetime, you know, and his contributions to society at mm -hmm. large. And then you have art that resonates in the public space, you know, whereby they used to embellish public buildings and spaces, you know, so people can connect, you know, for whatever reason, you know. And um, these days, artists in public spaces, I mean, judging from the international museums, where people even pay entry fees, you know, to go see art. And these days with technology, you can even immerse yourself mm -hmm. in your room. True. And that room itself constitutes the art. Yeah. So things have changed. Boundaries, boundaries are being blurred mm -hmm. every day. You know, so I think that art is all embracing and so encompassing yeah. now that um, it's, um, it's, no, it's no longer tenable for anyone to say that art is elitist. So how do, as an artist, yes. how do you decide what price that you're going to allocate to your works? Well, I think, uh, let me speak broadly first about uh, how value is attributed to a piece. Um, first of all, um, you must consider the artist's uh, contributions to local, the local narrative, historical art narrative in his own community, perhaps his country, and then internationally, what, has, what have been his contributions to global narratives, you know, what schools has the artist attended, if he, the more prestigious the schools are, there's more the likelihood that his value, of value for his work will be higher, uh, where has he exhibited in his lifetime, very important, and also, um, you know, um, who has bought his work, you know, such elements, even factors like that affect, for instance, if uh, a very famous person like Michael Jackson, you know, has bought a piece, even if it's the same work, you know, of similar size, similar year, similar theme by the same artist, it's more likely that that piece will cost more. Mm -hmm. You know, so these things are extremely important, you know. And of course, even within the mediums, there's a hierarchy, for instance, sculpture and painting costs and more traditional uh, mediums, for instance, might cost even more than the drawings, because drawings, you know, until fairly recently, were just uh, means of um, conceptualizing what you are going to produce, 
you know, they weren't viewed as a finished work in itself, you know, so, and then uh, painting in oils, for instance, you know, might con con fetch considerably more mm -hmm. than uh, painting with pastels or watercolor, you know, because oil, for instance, is not only a traditional medium, but, you know, has been known to last even longer than watercolor mm. that is uh, susceptible to ultraviolet light, you know, mm. yes, so yeah. I think broadly speaking, now how does an artist price his pieces? You know, there's also peer review. You know, what do your mates say about you? What do the critics say about your work? You know, these are very important things to consider when pricing your work. So if an upcoming artist, yes. or not even upcoming, I just, let's say I become a painter. Yes. You mentioned all these different things. So for example, yes. you went to a prestigious school and I went to a non-prestigious school. Yes. So the way you're going to price your work Yes. Is you're going to give you can give it a higher price because of the schools you've gone to compared to my schools? Well, yes, because uh, you know that uh, sometimes if you work with the gallery, the gallery helps to set your prices. Yeah. So ultimately, you know, the galleries or your manager or your agent, mm -hmm. you know, sets the prices based on the market. Got now it. you're only as good as what the market will offer sure. or pay for your work. Okay. So that is a very nice way of even settling things very yeah. easily. Now, what is the best way to preserve artworks? Okay. So, like, for example, the ones we have in your gallery now, yes. what's the best way to preserve them? Well, the best way to preserve uh, art, you know, at the very mundane level, is to make sure there's, uh, the humidity, you know, is right. You know, don't uh, have your works uh, very close to where there's a high content of moisture. You know, make sure, for instance, that... Uh, uh, your watercolors are not exposed to UV light, so you must face them away from sun sunlight. You know, you must have the right lighting, you know, on them, so that's not destructive to them. Um, uh, for an instance, in a gallery like this, be careful about those who are coming. They don't touch the pieces, mm. you know, especially with photography. You know, if it's not glassed, for instance, you don't want uh, the acid in your hands to affect it okay, later yeah. on. Uh, you must make sure children you know, are not even allowed here to run around. Mm -hmm. If you're having an exhibition opening, for instance, even little things like people carrying wine glasses, mm -hmm. you know, they shouldn't come in because there's a tendency or you're at risk of uh, wine spilling on the works and damaging the pieces. Got it. So these little rules are extremely important. Mm -hmm. You know, and how your work is framed is very important as well. If you, the, for instance, um, if you frame, you know, and the glass is touching the frame, you know, for instance, mm. there's a tendency that uh, in a humid environment, it will later on attach itself. Yes, to the glass. That, yes. So there has been enough space. Yes. And even for artists, you know, you must work even from the outset with the right materials, materials that would last. You know, you should make sure that you use acid-free paper because later on, you're going to have brown patches or spots maybe the next 30 years on your, on your pieces. Mm -hmm. So these are things you must, you know, you must take into consideration. So you have 13 years experience yes. and expertise from running a leading gallery in Africa, yes. which is Omenka Gallery. Yes. Can you talk about, can you talk a bit about what makes Omenka Gallery unique? Well, there are many things. I like that question. It's a very interesting question because even the name Omenka has a meaning. What does it mean? It means, um, I mean, in Igbo land where I'm from, it means um, someone who's creative. And um, it's a word I derived from my father's uh, manuscripts. Because when he passed away, I was going through some of his things. You know, we spoke of that earlier mm -hmm. when I said, uh, sat down with my siblings to decide what better structure and what, what's the best way to preserve his legacy. And we were going through his scripts and I saw, I noticed that he was always going to have a gallery in his lifetime, which he never mm -hmm. accomplished. And he was going to call it Omenka. So I said to myself, well, if I ever have a gallery, it will be in fulfillment of his dream. Now, why is Omenka unique? Omenka is unique because um, the artists that we represent, you know, have their own philosophy. It's very important. So um, we're, we're very um, focused on representing artists, you know, whose work resonates with the African continent because we believe in telling our own story. It's very important. Art history especially in Africa, has been written by the West. So I think it's about time we told our own story and presented facts the way, you know, they've actually occurred. Now, we, we also represent uh, not only Nigerian artists, we've got a Cameroonian artist, and we've got an American artist who's based in South Africa. But the key thing, you know, about uh, the artists we work with is that their works or the the, the the themes resonate with the African continent. Okay. So that's very important for us. Omenka is unique because... Uh, 
we not only represent artists here, and not only are we interested in showing their works here, but we've been to art fairs on about five continents, mm -hmm. you know, showcasing you know, some of the most prestigious international art fairs like the Armory, like Art Dubai, like uh, Cape Town Art Fair and Joburg Art Fair. Mm -hmm. So it's very important for us to, you know, expose the artists as much as possible to broader audiences. What opinion do you have on the state of visual artists and arts in Nigeria? Well, I think that uh, it's on the rise. I mean, you, you can't compare the state where we are now with 20 years ago. I mean, judging by the galleries, which are more professionally run, judging by the more exquisite catalogs, you know, containing critical text, you know, when you also consider that there's a secondary market now, we've got uh, two or three major auction houses that are doing extremely well and establishing the prices for Nigerian art and artists. You know, when you also look at the fact that we have international uh, events like the Lagos Biennale, you know, an artex, you know, and auction houses like mm -hmm. Art House Contemporary. I think these are very important uh, factors. I mean, just the other day, well, the EMC Shillon Museum was mm. birthed, you know, so you can see that there's a structure now beginning to form yeah. and that structure is extremely important. What we need now is public and private sector partnerships, the funding, how identifying the value chain, making sure there's government support, you know, mm. uh, you know, in creating, you know, um, a level playing field or to make sure that regulations, you know, you know, are in place. You know, for instance, we don't have uh, a national gallery of art, mm. you know, in, just like you'd have maybe the British Museum, for instance, where you can see the heritage of a people, you know, and I think that's extremely important, you know, in understanding ourselves better, you know, as a people and showing peaceful coexistence and, to coexistence and tolerance, you know, these things are very important. Yeah. You know? Now, as a government helping to encourage the private sector, for instance, to ensure um, that um, that uh, maybe through tax rebates to ensure that they support artists and you know do some serious policies towards the arts. Mm -hmm. uh, the government has come up with uh, uh, the CIFI initiative, you know, with the central bank. But when you look at it, there isn't anything for the visual artist. It's just technology, there's fashion, there's entertainment, mm -hmm. but the visual artists have been left out. Now, Alliance Frances. You know, there's a building just down the road and it's been donated by a very successful businessman, Mike Adenuga. And yet we have parking issues because when you have major events there, the mm -hmm. government has not been very forthcoming in supporting the visual arts, for instance. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you have a businessman, a local businessman who has put his own personal wealth, you know, in ensuring that uh, Lagos sits on the map, mm -hmm. you know, and you have cars being towed away. Now, I know that that space, for instance, that is outside where the cars are being towed away, you know, is problematic in the sense that cars shouldn't park there. But you can come to an agreement with the owners of the building and the French Cultural Center mm -hmm. to find out how best, because whatever is being done in that place projects Lagos, yeah. projects the art and culture of the people. And if we say that we're trying to diversify away from oil, you know, how is it that this institution has not been called into a dialogue, mm -hmm. for instance. So these are ways that the government, you know, can play a very important role in ensuring that our culture is propagated, our culture is preserved and promoted. Very important. Yeah. Okay. Using your father as a reference point yes. and looking at how much you have achieved yourself, you. what advice would you give to visual artists who are trying to not only achieve financial success, but also want to have longevity with their careers? Well, I think that you must not rest on your oars. You know, having temporary or fleeting success doesn't mean you've arrived yet. And every, any great artist or any person who's achieved anything, you know, in life, you know, has always not rested. You continue to strive to achieve perfection and excellence because uh, the boundaries of knowledge you can only push forward, you know, by a little bit. You know, all those have come before you and uh, you must, you know, achieve something to show that uh, you're counted. What impact do you have in your generation? What have you left? You know, whose life has, have you changed? But I think by far the most important uh, piece of advice I'll give anyone, especially a black person, is constantly read. Just devour everything that you have in sight because, uh, you know, it affects you, you know, and uh, it makes you, knowledge is power. 
you know, there's this saying that if you want to hide anything hide from a, a black man, put it in a book. It broadens your mind. You can travel in a book. You can speak better in a book. You can improve yourself in a book. You know, and there's so much information out there that you that is really in common place, but you'll never find it if you don't read. So for me, that's any advice. You want longevity, reinvent yourself. The only way you can do that is by reading. Yeah. Information is power. Yes. Well, thank you so much for your time, thank Oliver. You thank you, Shadi. Yeah. This episode is produced and edited by me, Bola Shade Anozie. Theme song for the show is by Imodu Ayonote. The podcast is available on Audio Mac, Podbean, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and Stitcher Radio. Simply search for the SNC Podcast, which is one word.